About 10 years ago, Tressie McMillan Cottom was confronted with a small but confounding mystery. She'd just started a new job at a cosmetology school in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was in a strip mall next door to a seafood restaurant, a gas station, and a convenience store. That's the campus. (laughs) That is the campus. That's right. Tressie's job was to enroll new students in this school. In a nine-month cosmetology program to help them with their financial aid paperwork. But Tressie soon realized this was not your typical college admissions job. It became pretty apparent to me early on that the types of students that I was working with, mostly very low-income women of color, often single moms, needed a whole lot more from me. More might mean Tressie would end up holding a crying baby during a meeting with a prospective student. These women would come to me with their babies, you know, in tow. That was more common than uh, having them show up with, say, their parents. I held babies. I held hands. I gave them rides home when their boyfriends took their car and the buses had stopped running. And then there was this one request students kept coming into Tressie's office with that she really wasn't prepared for. So I would get young women who would come and they'd sit in my office and I would be talking to them about changing their life and starting at this cosmetology school. And overwhelmingly, they were very quiet, very reticent. Until the moment when she would say, I would say, well, do you have any questions? And the prospective student would slide this piece of paper onto Tressie's desk and say, yeah, can you confirm that I was here today? Right. Can you certify that I was here? The paperwork all these women were sliding across Tressie's desk asking her to sign was a very specific set of paperwork. Their certification paperwork to remain eligible for their welfare benefits. As Tressie watched this stream of cosmetology students coming to her to handle their welfare documents, what was your reaction at first? Is this like, wait, what? what is going on here? Why does this keep Absolutely. happening? Absolutely. Yeah, because there had been no, this was not part of my training for the job at all. Welcome to the uncertain hour, where the things we fight the most about are the things we know the least about. I'm Chrissy Clark, senior correspondent for Marketplace's Wealth and Poverty Desk, and this is our podcast where we dig deep into the uncertainties of our economy today and try to make some sense of making it in America. This season, we've been going deep into one topic, welfare. Cash welfare for poor families. How does it work? Who's on it? Two decades after welfare reform, when a Republican Congress passed a bill and a Democratic president signed it. Ending welfare as we know it. What the heck is welfare today? In the last few episodes, which you should listen to if you haven't, We've been looking at how different states spend their federal welfare money in some very surprising ways. Today, on this episode, we go back to an even more fundamental question. In the wake of welfare reform, how is welfare actually helping poor people today? And that paperwork that prospective beauty school students kept asking Tressie to fill out? Well, that is a key part of the answer to that question. But to understand what I mean... Let me back up a bit. Now, if you've been listening to the whole season of The Uncertain Hour, you'll recognize this music. Probably some of you can sing along with it by now. You don't have to stay there for the rest of your time. This song was, in its small way, a sort of anthem for the welfare reform movement in the early 1990s. And the message of this song, to get off welfare and get a job, any job, was at the heart of the battle over welfare reform. There was this sort of fork in the road back then. As welfare roles grew in the 70s through the early 90s, policy wonks and politicians and the heads of county welfare offices were debating how best to get people off welfare. And two main approaches were up for debate. One road, investing more welfare spending in education. Basically, helping welfare recipients who'd often dropped out of school get more skills, a GED, maybe even a college degree. 
Joe Hutz, a labor economist that specializes in welfare policy, says the idea was that more education may make welfare recipients less susceptible to the ups and downs of the labor market. Maybe it'll lead to a more long-term position in the labor force. Maybe it'll lead to higher wages and maybe it'll build self-esteem. In one way or another, the theory was they'd fare better in the job market and not need welfare anymore. The other road welfare reformers were considering has come to be known as the work-first approach. This approach dismissed all but the most basic education as a waste of time and money. Instead, the best way to help people on welfare, according to the work-firsters? Get people into a job immediately. We're not going to train you for years. We're not going to send you to school for years. We're going to show you how to find a job. That's welfare reformer Larry Townsend. He also happens to be the man behind that song. Join the workforce, don't be and in the end, that song and the work first approach won out in the debates around welfare reform. Since then, the cash welfare system has had built into it all these rules focused on making sure recipients are doing some kind of work or work related activity in order to qualify for welfare. And those rules have, at the same time, been very unfriendly to most forms of education. With a few key exceptions, which brings us back to Tressie McMillan Cottom, newly arrived at her job at that cosmetology school in the mid-2000s, a decade after welfare reform had kicked in. She was trying to figure out why so many students kept sliding welfare paperwork across her desk. At first, she wondered, maybe this was just happening to her? I go to some of the senior uh, admissions people uh, in the office and ask them about it the first time it happens. And they go, oh, yeah, we do this all of the time. Not just filling out welfare paperwork, but dealing with other parts of the welfare bureaucracy. I filled it phone calls from their caseworkers who needed to confirm that they were indeed enrolled in a, what we call short-term workforce credential program. And that thing that Tressie just said, that they were indeed enrolled in a what we call short-term workforce credential program. She wouldn't realize it until later, but that was the answer to her question. Why are so many students coming to me talking about welfare? Because her beauty school specialized in short-term workforce credential programs. Tressie hasn't worked for the cosmetology school in years. Today, she's a professor of sociology at Virginia Commonwealth University. But she's kept thinking about that experience she had with the beauty school students and all their welfare paperwork. And that's the question that ends up animating like my research later as a um, Ph.D. student and now as a sociologist and professor, which was how did that happen? Um, And this is what I've I've come to. What she's come to is that it all comes back to welfare reform and that fork in the road 20 years ago when reformers decided to take the work-first approach and leave the education approach behind. That decision brought a lot of new work requirements and time limits to the cash welfare system. The details get a little complicated, but bear with me for a moment. Before welfare reform, you got a check based on your economic need. And what you did with your time after that was up to you. Maybe you worked a little or went to school on the side. But since welfare reform... In order to qualify for a welfare check, the average person has to spend at least 30 hours in some sort of, quote, work activity. Those who are receiving welfare benefits need to either be working or to be doing everything in their power to be working as quickly as possible. That might mean volunteering at a job or going to a job search club where you're coached on how to find a job. But if you want to pursue any education and still be eligible for welfare at the same time, you only have 12 months where your schooling counts as your full work activity. After 12 months, you can still go to school, but you have to add another work activity on top of school for at least 20 hours, which just makes everything hard to juggle. Which is why a short-term workforce credential program has become one of the only practical choices for people on welfare who want to pursue an education. These programs, sometimes called short-term certificate programs, are basically courses that last from a few weeks to a few months and are geared specifically towards training you for a particular job, meaning no degrees in English literature, too vague, not even a nursing degree, takes too long. 
In fact, one of the only simple ways to get an education while still qualifying for welfare since welfare reform is to sign up for something like that nine-month cosmetology program that Tressie used to enroll students in back in North Carolina. As Tressie looked into the way the welfare system works now, it started to make sense why that cosmetology school she worked at was so popular among welfare recipients, because it specialized in programs that were short enough and worky enough. And I went, oh, that was why I had so many women presenting their credentialing paperwork to remain benefits eligible for TANF. That is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, a.k.a. Cash Welfare. Just by the virtue of how the social policy was designed and implemented, there are only so many programs that qualify. So what do you make of this? <laughs> is, <laughs> is this? I mean, on the one hand, you could say, well, the welfare mm-hmm. reforms were all about getting mm-hmm. people into jobs. And mm-hmm. I mean, was this a, a good way of mm-hmm. helping people become more skilled mm-hmm. so that they could lift themselves up? You know, can you get people into a job? Short term credentials can absolutely do that. But Tressie says, when you're talking about a population as vulnerable as the folks cycling through welfare programs, typically single moms with a couple kids living on less than seven or eight hundred dollars a month, who bring with them um, um, a host of risk factors for re-entering into poverty, right? They're more likely to have not completed high school, for example. Uh, They're more likely to have housing instability, all things that make finding and keeping a good job and skilling up very challenging. She says for people in that situation, already facing so many challenges, sometimes a short-term certificate program just doesn't give them enough time or training to really help them find a job, let alone good work, sustainable work, long-term work. Short-term certificates and credentials may not be that, especially when they're short-term credentials that are very expensive. In Tressie's academic research, she's also discovered that while sometimes short-term credential programs are offered at community colleges, in many places around the country, the only school you can find one is a for-profit school like the cosmetology school where she used to work. Back in the mid-2000s, a nine-month certificate program there cost about $15,000. That's the kind of price tag that will almost certainly require piling up a lot of student debt, an especially bad thing for someone on welfare, already struggling financially. Tressie says because welfare reform has effectively limited the education choices of welfare recipients to these short-term credentialing programs, Welfare reform has also limited the ability of poor, struggling families to climb up the economic ladder. If what it was supposed to do was actually change the quality of poor people's lives, short-term credentials, especially when they're high cost, may not be at all the type of social prescription we want. Over the course of my reporting in the last nine months on welfare and welfare reform, I've been thinking a lot about that question that Tressie just asked. If what it was supposed to do was actually change the quality of poor people's lives. Is changing the quality of poor people's lives what welfare is designed to do now? And if it is, how's it working out? Because education is kind of the go-to strategy for helping lift people out of poverty. Right. I mean, it's become almost the only ticket left to the middle class going to college. So why make that harder? This is Amy Scott, senior correspondent covering education at Marketplace and also all-around amazing reporter. Hey, Amy. Ah, oh, shucks. <laughs> Hi, Chrissy. How are you? Um, I'm good. And I wanted to bring you into this conversation because you think so much about education and its role in the economy. And we've been talking, you and I, about why welfare reform would have focused so much on these short-term credentials. And meanwhile, kind of pushed welfare recipients into them as their only educational option at the expense of allowing people to get higher degrees. So you've been digging deeper into this question. Yes. And I talked to a guy named Robert Rector, who's with the Heritage Foundation and is sometimes known as the intellectual godfather of welfare reform. Oh, I 
know his name well. He's all over the 1996 welfare reform law, including the work requirements. That's the guy. And for reformers like him, it just didn't make sense to spend a lot of taxpayer money sending welfare recipients to college, when at that time, almost half of them hadn't even finished high school. Most people who are are dependent on welfare uh, have a long history of not doing really well in the classroom. And therefore, sending them back into the classroom generally doesn't produce very good results. Of course, I should say that there is a lot of debate about that and and how well students do depends a lot on the kinds of supports they get in school. But for Robert Rector, it was also a question of fairness. Most American workers, he points out, about 60 percent, don't have college degrees. And the idea of taking all these single parents that are on welfare and saying, well, the solution there is, is to tax everybody else and put them through college. It's neither efficient nor equitable. So as I talked to people like Robert Rector, I started to realize that even though I'd thought the whole purpose of welfare reform was to get people out of poverty, in some ways it was just to get them off of welfare and into the labor force. And Robert Rector said, you know, If they still earn poverty wages, give them other kinds of support, like food stamps, Medicaid, and tax credits. What we did was say, we want to move people into the labor force, into any job that they can take, and then if they're not earning enough to raise the family above the poverty level, we're going to use taxpayer funds to supplement those wages. So he's sort of saying that a situation where women on welfare are being kind of shunted into these short-term certificate programs, like the ones you get at a cosmetology school, they may lead to pretty low-paying jobs, but that's not necessarily a problem with the current welfare system. That's That was sort of the idea, is that this would help get them into some kind of job, and then people would go from there. Yeah. The idea was if people want to get training, it should be quick and it should lead directly to a job. And not be too expensive for taxpayers. Yeah. And I talked to some students on welfare who are in one of those training programs today. I wanted to see what education on welfare looks like. And this is here in Baltimore. I'm going to take you to a garage on the west side of the city, a 12-week automotive technician training program. And that sound you're hearing is Danielle Slater raising a gold Honda minivan on a hydraulic lift so that she and the rest of her class can practice changing the brake pads. One more click. Danielle's taking the class with her husband, Alexander. They're both in their early 30s and on cash assistance or welfare. And they found out about this class through the Welfare Workforce Development Office. It's offered for free by a group called Catholic Charities. And they spend their days learning to do things like change oil and fix the air conditioning in cars. And then they get other sorts of job readiness training, doing mock interviews, learning how to dress and have good posture, how to make eye contact. When they graduate in July, they'll be qualified for entry-level jobs at an auto repair shop. Here's Danielle Slater. I always picture myself with Jiffy Lube. I don't know why, though. I assume you have Jiffy Lube in California, Chrissy? (laughs) We do have Jiffy Lube. Yes, I've been there. I could just see me with Jiffy Lube. Probably because they got more commercials. (laughs) But me, I don't, it really don't matter where I started because, like, our goal is to get our own, our own business. Do you have a name picked out for your business? Uh, I wasn't sure. What name you said? I said Later Slaters. Later Slaters? Yes. I like the name. Danielle says her dad has already printed up business cards for them. <laughs> With our names and numbers on there. And yeah, he was like, y'all is just so amazing. I'm so proud of my babies. And it just feels so good. So that's kind of the dream scenario for welfare reformers like Robert Rector, that this kind of quick and dirty bite-sized training program can help people like Danielle and Alexander Slater get off welfare and into the workforce. And then the rest is up to them. And if they do get jobs coming out of this program, like how much would they be making? 
At first, probably just about 11 or $12 an hour. That would be an entry-level job at a place like Jiffy Lube or Napa Auto Care. So that's better than minimum wage, but it's not necessarily enough to lift them out of poverty, especially because between them, they have six kids to support. And I guess that's kind of the promise, but also the limitation of a short-term credentialing program like the one that they're in. Right. I mean, studies have shown that people who earn even very short-term credentials do make more money. I talked to an economist named Leslie Turner at the University of Maryland, and in one study she did, women on welfare who earned short-term certificates made about 24 percent more than they had before entering the program. So that sounds great, but in dollar terms, that meant they were making about twelve to $16,000 a year. Which is still not a lot of money. Yeah, still poverty-level wages, at least in the short term. But here's the thing. There was a group of welfare recipients in that study who did a lot better. They made about 133% more after leaving welfare. And those were the ones who got longer-term credentials, like an associate's degree. Here's that economist, Leslie Turner. This is true not just for cash assistance recipients. It's true across the board. Individuals who earn college degrees have higher earnings on average. They have lower unemployment rates. They, you know, experienced shorter times of unemployment during the last recession. And in the 20 years since welfare reform, it's only gotten harder to make it in this economy without a college degree. But as we've been discovering, college degrees are really hard to get the way that welfare works now. And that was an explicit policy choice. When welfare reform happened 20 years ago, higher education was the road not taken. And we've been wondering what that's meant for individual people's lives. And so now I'm going to turn things over to you for a little bit, Amy. I have the con. The con? Yeah. It's, uh, it's from Battlestar Galactica. You have the con, <laughs> like when I when I get control of the ship. <laughs> oh, whoa. You went deep, deep nerd just there. <laughs> that was pretty deep nerd. <laughs> okay, so take it away, Amy. You have the con. Tell us the story of these two women that you've spent time with who were on cash welfare and trying to go to college around the time of welfare reform in the mid-90s. And in some ways, this is a tale of what was and what might have been, because their stories worked out really differently. I'll start with a woman named Ilana Gamble. In 1995, she was living in San Jose, California, divorced with three kids, when she found out that her ex-husband, who'd been in prison for selling drugs, was about to be released. So Ilana took her $5,000 in savings, packed up the kids, and boarded a train that would take them 3,000 miles across the country. We had two choices. We could either stick a pin in a map or come here because I had relatives here. Here is a small town in rural southern Maryland called La Plata. And I had an aunt that owned an apartment building, so I was kind of like, got a place to live. So it worked out. It worked out really well that we came here. Ilana has reddish blonde hair and these clear green eyes. You can tell she's got Irish roots. She can say now that it all worked out at the age of 53, but back then she knew that $5,000 wouldn't last long with three kids who were 1, 8, and 10 at the time. So while she looked for jobs, she applied for government assistance. She got about $400 a month in cash welfare, plus food stamps and a small housing stipend. Eventually, she picked up some weekend shifts bartending at her aunt's restaurant. And between welfare and the job, they got by. Barely, yeah. It wasn't unheard of for me to have to uh, write my mom a check when it came time for taxes because I would have been borrowing throughout the year and then I'd get my taxes and I'd have to cut her a check. Sometimes my mom and my aunt, (laughs) you know, that's pretty much how I made ends meet then. But Alana didn't like working in a bar and she wanted a better life. So while she was still on welfare at 33, she went back to school at Charles County Community College. I wanted to do some type of business management, um, whether that be a dental office, a real real estate office, whatever I could find. I didn't want to be in the service business, put it that way. She loved her classes, except for math, and she did well. In fact, it's crazy because I was a terrible student in high school. I mean, I'm talking terrible with a capital T because I didn't want to to do the work. And then when I came back to school, um, I amazed myself. She was getting straight A's, she says. 
and this is Chrissy just jumping in again, but that's a really interesting fact because it sort of goes against what Robert Rector was worried about, that if you were on welfare and you didn't do well in high school, you probably weren't going to do much better when you went back to the classroom. Yeah, but at least for Alana, she really thrived when she went back to school. She says she was on her way to an associate's degree. I knew I could get the degree, and I probably would have went on then to get a bachelor's because it was so easy. I'd have had that thing framed and hanging in the front window, you know what I mean, kind of thing, to show it off. You know, unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way. Partway through her third semester in early 1997, she got a letter from the welfare office. The law had just changed, and in order to qualify for cash welfare, she would have to spend more time every week in a sanctioned work activity. Remember, she was already bartending part-time. Now she would have to get more hours at the bar or find another job, do volunteer work, or spend time at the welfare office applying for jobs. Local welfare offices had some discretion about what they would allow, and Alana says she was told her school hours would not count. Essentially, they want me to make up those hours in their work program. Well, I couldn't go to school and work and go to their work program. There was just no way out of it, so one had to go. And I had to obviously leave school to continue working to support my three children. At the end of that semester, she dropped out of college. Amy, do you have any idea how many Alana Gambles are out there? Like, how many college students on welfare dropped out after welfare reform? Well, we don't really know. Uh, What we do know is that before welfare reform, there were about 685,000 people who reported in their applications for federal financial aid that they were on welfare. And just a few years later, that number dropped by almost half. Of course, we don't know how much of that decline was due to people like Alana dropping out of college or not going at all to keep their welfare benefits, or from people staying in college but leaving welfare. Because we know the welfare rolls dropped overall, so I guess the number of students on welfare would drop too. Right. And, of course, there were other factors going on at the same time. The economy was booming in the late 1990s, so jobs were plentiful. There was also a series of expansions of a tax credit for low-income workers, the Earned Income Tax Credit. And those factors may also have pushed a lot of people both out of college and off cash assistance. But no matter how you cut it, welfare reform definitely did make it more difficult to go to college and to continue to receive benefits. It did, but some people still managed to make it work. So remember I said this is a story about two women trying to make college work on welfare. And a few hours' drive from where Ilana Gamble's college education was ending, a different story played out here in Baltimore. Yeah. We your student profile with your test scores. Oh, I bought that with Okay, we need that. Wait, so who is this, Amy? That's the only way we can get you in the class. That is Patricia Edwards giving an orientation to new students taking so-called developmental or remedial classes at Baltimore City Community College. And these classes can be pretty discouraging for students, so she runs a support program to help them stick with it. First of all, well, I let every cohort of students know I'm honored to serve you in this capacity, okay? Because I started out at Baltimore City Community College in developmental education, okay? so. We know what's possible, right? Patricia is a really striking woman. She's tall with a shaved head, and she was wearing these long feather earrings. She's 49 now and works as coordinator for academic services at the college. But 20 years ago, she was a single mom raising three sons with an on and off job at the post office. It wasn't what I was meant to do, and it wasn't meant for me to have intervals of severe poverty. Because that's what was happening. Then she came across a story in the newspaper. About Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey, if I'm not mistaken, that's the name. Lynn Woolsey, a Democrat from California, had been in the news a lot during the debates over welfare reform. Here she is speaking before a committee in 1996. I was a welfare mother. And without that, I do not know what our family would have done. We needed She that had, um, I think, been divorced. And she... Um, Went on welfare and went to college. So Patricia Edwards quit her job at the post office and applied for welfare with the intention of enrolling in college. That takes guts after reading a story in a newspaper to do that. 
Yeah, but what she didn't know was that by that time, the welfare system had changed, making it harder to go to college while on welfare. And at first, to meet the work requirements for cash benefits, she found herself doing job training, like she remembers stuffing toys in those little plastic bubbles that kids get in grocery store vending machines. She stayed for about 10 minutes for that one. I felt humiliated. Yeah, I felt like the scum of the earth. <laughs> you got me here doing this for this little bit of money a month. I'm not doing this. I'm going to go find a job and do something with myself, but I'm not going to sit here and be humiliated like this. Then Patricia got lucky. In the fall of 1998, Baltimore City Community College was starting a two-year pilot program. The idea was to test whether people on cash welfare who got a certificate or degree fared better in the labor market than those who didn't. So with the permission of the state, Baltimore City Community College allowed about 200 students receiving cash welfare to go to school and count their school time as work. Basically what that other woman who you talked to had not been able to do. Exactly. Alana Gamble in La Plata had not been able to do that. And being able to count her school hours toward the work requirement made it a lot easier for Patricia Edwards to enroll full time. And by this time, she was supporting four sons. She had another baby. They supported her too. I used to get them to read my books to me while I was like ironing or washing or cooking or whatever I might have been doing. They would read the book. They were kind of good at that. I love that she enlisted her kids to help her with her homework. I know. I totally teared up when she said that. (laughs) And like Alana Gamble, Patricia had struggled in high school. She'd had her first son at 15 and dropped out just two months before graduation, though she eventually got her GED. But as a college student at 31, she wanted to set an example for her boys. Everything I read, everything they see on TV, everything that they're going to teach us in school will tell them. It's like, oh, you're a black male with a single mother. You're going to be on drugs. You're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing that. All negativity. And I was bound and determined that my sons would see something better. It took five years, but she earned two associate's degrees in public policy and general studies. Then she went on to get a bachelor's degree and finally got off welfare. Now she's working on a master's in public administration and making a good living helping struggling students succeed. Which is why I love my job so much, because now I can give back what was so freely given to me. In her office on campus, the walls are decorated with inspirational quotations. She's got cards and letters from students she's helped. And there's a framed photo where she's surrounded by four young men smiling in tuxedos, her grown sons at a family wedding. I like to have inviting things in my office for people to ask about, rather than a bunch of degrees. Yeah, my degrees are, degrees are still in the envelopes in my house because I, I feel like people just need an opportunity, you know? And sometimes degrees are intimidating for people who have done a lot of things to mess it up, and it makes you hesitant to ask for the help. So, Amy, it sounds like 20 years after that pilot program that allowed her to go to college, Patricia's doing really well. What happened to the rest of the students that were involved in that pilot program? It would be great to say that things worked out so well for everyone in Patricia's group of 200 students, but the evidence of the program's success was mixed. So the University of Maryland School of Social Work studied that pilot program at BCCC. Two years after they started, just under 30% of the students had earned a degree or certificate. About 40% were still enrolled, and the rest had dropped out. I talked to research director Letitia Passarella, who says that compared to a similar group of welfare recipients that didn't go to school, the students in Patricia's group were not significantly more likely to be employed or to stay off welfare. But they did have higher wages. It certainly seems like for those individuals who did obtain a grade that it did make a difference. I think um, what would have been much more useful is to do some more longer term follow up um, because much of the research has indicated that the um, benefits of an education are actually delayed and that those who have a degree may not necessarily realize the earning potential until three or five years later. 
And that kind of longer term study never happened. Which I've noticed is an issue coming out of welfare reform altogether. There haven't been a lot of long term follow up studies about how different programs are working. Well, Letitia also studied what happens to people in Maryland overall after they leave welfare, mostly without education and training. Seven in 10 of them work, she says, but mostly in low-paying industries without benefits or opportunities to move up. In one analysis, only 9% of welfare leavers saw any growth in earnings five years later. That's the important point because... It contradicts the idea that a client can go out and get a job, any job, and then they will experience earnings growth because they gain skills and are able to be promoted to the next level. It seems that that is pretty rare amongst clients who leave welfare. Which raises that bigger question again. Since welfare reform, how good is the system at helping people get out of poverty and climb the economic ladder? Or is that even what the system is really designed to do? And that brings us back to the story of Alana Gamble, the woman who dropped out of college after welfare reform. She eventually got a full-time job bartending at her aunt's restaurant and got off welfare. She worked there for several years and then at a chain restaurant for a while. She still lives in La Plata and still works in the service industry. I drove out to see her recently at a banquet facility she manages for the Navy. You're hearing her opening up the outdoor bar there, getting ready for the evening crowd. What is hard to do when there's sun in your eyes? It's a government job with benefits, but she's making less than $40,000 a year, less than she'd made bartending full-time, and less than she'd be making doing the same job with a college degree. Because she's on the government pay scale, that means someone coming in fresh out of college makes more than what she's making with all her experience. She never went back to college, though she's thought about it. I have many times, but it just never was feasible anymore. Just financially, I couldn't do it. But Alana did something else proponents of welfare reform encouraged. She got married to a customer she met at the bar. Her husband makes a good salary as an engineer, and together they've done well. Thanks to my husband. <laughs> yeah, we're middle class, definitely. Um, we, we ended up doing all right for ourselves, so I can't complain. And you know, Chrissy, she's not bitter about what happened. I mean, I, I get it. I totally get that um, they want to get people off welfare. And, it, and essentially it worked for me because it forced me off of it. But it forced me into a situation where I I couldn't go very far. And she wonders how far she could have gone with a college degree. That was Amy Scott, senior correspondent covering education for Marketplace. Amy, thank you so much. My pleasure. So... That is the road not taken when it comes to how welfare reform handled higher education. And frankly, as I've been reporting on welfare reform over the last few months, I have found the fields strewn with roads not taken. That's part of what happens when you overhaul a system like welfare. Our leaders at the time picked a set of priorities. We focused on work first rather than education. And then, through the block grant system, we gave states the power to spend very little money on either priority, work preparedness or education. All this has left us with a system where the welfare roles have dropped by a lot since welfare reform. But poverty rates have stayed about the same, and most poor families in America don't receive any cash welfare at all. Which brings us back to that question— of whether welfare reform has improved the quality of poor people's lives. It's not that clear. There are more families living in deep poverty today than 20 years ago. There are fewer people on welfare pursuing college degrees. Many people have gotten off welfare and into jobs, but many have slipped through the cracks. Cash welfare is a complicated and ornate system, and in six podcast episodes, we can't get to everything. Yes, this is the final episode of The Uncertain Hour. And this is maybe the part where you're expecting a rallying cry or a defense or a tidy conclusion. But we are not going to spend these last moments of the season telling you what to think about how welfare has changed. 
What we hope we've done is lay out some of the more unexpected ways the system has worked, so you can judge for yourself if the system is working. Cash welfare as we know it now turns 20 years old in 2016. After a series of short-term extensions, the current welfare law faces another reauthorization deadline this September. It's prompted some lively conversations in Congress about how cash welfare should and shouldn't work. But so far, no concrete changes. And of course, however Congress handles or doesn't handle the cash welfare program will say a lot about what we as a country do collectively for and about those with the least in it. In the next few months, you can hear more of our coverage of welfare and wealth and poverty issues at Marketplace.org. I'll be gone for a few months as I face my own private uncertain hour, namely the uncertain hour of when I will have a baby. I am eight and a half months pregnant right now. But we will be back after that for another season of The Uncertain Hour. And we would love your suggestions of what we should dive into next. Something that we fight a lot about, but know just a little about. In the meantime, hopefully you can go back to your dinner table conversations, go back to your sidewalk debates, armed with a little less uncertainty. So that this one thing that we fight about so much, welfare, at least we know a little more about it now. Are you working? What kind of work do you do? That's it for this episode and this season of The Uncertain Hour. The Uncertain Hour happens this week because of producer Caitlin Esch, associate producer Gina Delvac, senior editor Nancy Fargali, engineers Jake Gorski and Dana Olsevsky, Mark Miller is the managing editor, Satara Nieves is the executive producer, and Deborah Clark is the vice president of Marketplace. Special thanks to Ben Wynn for sound design consulting, to Betsy Streisand for editing help, also to Jenny Hatfield, Megan Ellingbow, and Tina Admins. Also to Julie Strawn, Anthony Carnavale, Shamika Kaskins, Anita Reese, and Aaron DeSmet at Adrian College. And another special thanks to Tressie McMillan Cottom, whose book, Lower Ed, How For-Profit Colleges Deepen Inequality, comes out this fall. I'm Chrissy Clark, senior correspondent with Marketplace's Wealth and Poverty Desk, which is supported by the Ford Foundation. And I will never stop saying it. Thank you so much for all the amazing reviews you've been tweeting at us and putting on iTunes. They really help us continue the work that we're doing. Please keep them coming. We're at MP Wealth Poverty. Oh, and one last thing. We have a special bonus episode of The Uncertain Hour by popular demand. I'm very excited to say that we have the entire set of Welfare to Work songs that we talk about in episode one for your listening pleasure. All of their 90s synth pop glory, you can listen from beginning to end to every single one. Keep your eye out for that in your podcast feed coming soon. This is APM.